Welcome to Current Affairs. My name is Nathan Robinson. I am the editor in chief of Current Affairs magazine. I am joined today by R.S. Benedict, the most dangerous woman in speculative fiction, host of the Right Good podcast. R.S. Benedict can be found at rsbenedict.substack.com. And she's here today because she's the author of an essay published a couple of years ago, but of enduring relevance called Everyone is Beautiful and No One is Horny, published in Blood Knife, one of the most fascinating things I've read in a while, and I'm so excited for R.S. Benedict to join us today on Current Affairs. Hello. Hello. Thanks for having me on. So, this essay, Everyone is Beautiful and No One is Horny, you draw attention to what you describe as a trend in cinema, a trend that I don't think I had consciously noticed until reading your essay, until you pointed out what had happened. But the moment you pointed it out, I realized that you were right, and it was true. So perhaps you could tell us the particular trend that you're calling attention to in this essay. Well, what I'm calling attention to is this very strange, I don't know if convergence is the right word, of two things that I noticed in cinema, particularly in big budget American cinema, which is that while beauty standards have gotten more and more freakishly, inhumanly unattainable and perfectionistic for men and for women, movies have gotten less and less sexy, less and less sexualized. And I don't just mean a lack of sex scenes, but a lack of any kind of desire. Even during the Hayes Code, there was a sense of desire. Hitchcock very famously had that train going into the tunnel in <laughs> the West. Yeah. Filmmakers, even during times of very strict censorship, were still able to approach human sexuality and discuss it and allude to it despite limitations. And here it's just gone. So you have these bizarrely perfect people with absurdly perfect bodies, and they have no interest in each other. And it's very, very strange and very sad. And you point out, yes, that when you go back to, I mean, you've just mentioned uh, films of the 30s, 40s, 50s. You talk in the essay about films of the 80s and 90s, where now you can go back to things like the Terminator, and you can be kind of shocked and surprised when you suddenly see e explicit sex, and that's when you realize that this is a thing that has kind of disappeared or diminished. Yeah, it's wild. I mean, it was kind of normal to have sexuality sex scenes in any kind of movie, in mainstream movies, and in, in comedies, up until pretty recently, and it's just sort of gone. It's just completely gone, and there's no, not even desire, not even like wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Hmm. It's just any kind of sexuality, any kind of desire is just gone. People got really excited about the new Batman movie, and I think they kiss each other once. That's it. <laughs> well, you know, what I uh, thought of uh, when I was just reviewing your essay again for this is I, I recently went to see the big Avatar movie, the three-hour-long Avatar movie, and... They're all, like, basically naked, yeah. right? They're all these, these beautiful blue creatures, perfectly formed. And I can't remember, maybe there's mild flirtation? I can't even remember if there was that. The original, they at least did have some kind of weird alien hair sex or something. Like, there was something. <laughs> okay, I didn't see the original, I only saw the sequel. <laughs> We were just about jellyfish and things. Just, just as like sea creatures moving. It was very pleasant. Yeah. <laughs> and it's very, very strange. My thesis is that it has to do with a couple of different things. One is just the way we've become more and more afraid of our own bodies. Mm. The way we've started to see ourselves as sort of a consciousness floating outside of our bodies, acting upon our bodies. And it's our job to optimize our bodies according to whatever standard is current, and it's usually not based on what would be fun to live in, but based on what's ideal. I definitely notice this more with heterosexual men. Heterosexual men are all like counting this and, and counting protein grams and really focused on improving their bodies, but not in a way that admits like, I want women to look at me, <laughs> which is a little sad. Yeah. Like so many men are trying to look like you know, the liver king or Joe Rogan, but I don't think any women are looking at those guys going like, oh man, I wish my boyfriend looked like that. 
Yeah, I don't know who wants to look quite like Joe Rogan, because Joe Rogan looks like a big thumb. But... I don't know, but <laughs> enough men are trying to imitate him Yeah, that apparently they want to, which is odd. You're right. Someone actually, in I think an article quoting your article, actually compiled the statistics on this to confirm that your, your theory is not just an impression. It can be tracked objectively, the decline, the cutting in half. I think of any of sex scenes in movies is a massive, massive drop. And it coincides with another objective fact about the world, which is the reduction of the actual frequency of young people having sex that has been commented on. Right. And I mean, I'm not sure how to diagnose that or where that's coming from. I think there's just a lot of a big variety of different things coming together. Poor economy, the increased animization of society where it's just It's harder to meet people at all. It's harder to make friends. We've created a society where we just sort of work and then go home and that's it. And there's just not a lot of opportunities to Mm -hmm. meet people and and make any kind of relationships, including just friendships. People have fewer friends than they used to, too, which is heartbreaking, which is really saddening. So in some ways, the tendency in cinema that you're talking about in this is is reflective of a, a general kind of the sexing of society. But I think one of the interesting things about the kind of the- thesis that you advance is you talk a lot about how even as sex has declined, violence and the preparation for war has kind of taken its place in some ways. Right. That was something I noticed after 9-11. There was this massive increase of militarism in culture, in art. In my high school, they had sort of military recruitment guys coming in and having these special days in gym where we'd practice like throwing fake grenades and doing sort of military drills and things like that. Mm. So there's this focus on exercise, not so that you can feel good or you can look good. It's like, I need to fight. I need to train. I need peak performance. Like people talk a lot about performance. I need my body to perform. Well, what, what's your body performing? Hmm. What's it performing? Violence, I guess, is what it's supposed to perform. It's supposed to perform war and not having a good time. Yes, I think the having a good time is such an important part of it, right? Because the, the things you're talking about in terms of, you know, we work out rather than exercise. Or we train. We train, train for something. Yes. <laughs> what are We're we training. training. What are you training for? Are you training yeah. for a marathon? I understand if you're, like, training for a specific thing. I'm training for a marathon. I'm training for a race. That makes perfect sense to me. But a person who just routinely goes to the gym calling it training, like, Mm -hmm. what are you training for? And we have these special exercise classes called like boot camp, like booty boot camp. Like, is there a booty war that I'm not aware of (laughs) that we're all enlisting into? Are, Are we going to fight the great booty war? Like what's happening? Yes, well, of course, it's literally imported for the military, right? These buko, you too can go to boot camp. <laughs> and you're like, yeah. yeah, but they're training to make war. What am I here for? <laughs> I don't want to go to boot camp. I just want to look hot. <laughs> <laughs> so wonderful about your piece is it raises these profound, deep questions about, you know, what is life for? What are the ends of everything? What are we trying to do <laughs> uh, here on Earth with our time? Yeah. I mean, I... It's weird. Some people have responded to it, accusing me of not wanting people to be healthy or something. Of, oh, you just want everyone to be sedentary. No, I don't. I don't want people to be unhealthy. I myself go to the gym four times a week. Usually I exercise regularly. I just want people to be normal about it and not weird about it and to enjoy themselves and not stress out so much. Because while this has gone on, eating disorders have massively increased in frequency among men and women. I think there's kind of a hidden epidemic of it among men because Mm. a lot of the behavior is not what we'd typically recognize as disordered. And it's sort of coded in this masculine way. But how many male life coaches preach some kind of really weird diet? And they coach it in terms of strength or performance. But when a female influencer urges her followers, her female followers, to cut out half the food groups and obsess over everything, we go like... Oh, that's a disorder. Right. Right. But when a man does it, when a male influencer does it, it's like, no, you should get rid of all other food and eat nothing but raw testicles. We're like, yeah, that's okay. (laughs) That's normal. There's nothing weird about this. Yeah. No, that is the case. In fact, it's interesting that you say people have accused you of being sort of anti-health. I 
see it totally the opposite as a critique of this bizarre concept of what a healthy human life is. I mean, as we know, bodybuilders have like a very low life expectancy, right? They all die right. because it's not good for you to be <laughs> to, to just push your body to those limits. First off, it's not fun. And second off, then it kills you. And athletes <laughs> too. Athletes have terrible health problems later in life. It's a strange concept of fitness, really. Yeah. Can you tell us a little more about this trend in movies and the things that you've observed? There's just, I don't watch enough movies to kind of know. I had an intuitive sense that you were right the moment I read it, but I don't watch enough movies to know the trend. Maybe you could give us some examples of things that told you that there was a real difference here and that the difference was worth paying attention to. Well, I think the best way to look at it is comparing current superhero movies to older ones, ones that I grew up with. The MCU is perfect for it. The Batman series is perfect for it. Recent Batman movies, there's not much of a relationship. The Tim Burton Batman movies were weirdly horny. <laughs> Just absurdly, bizarrely horny. You had Michelle Pfeiffer in a, a BDSM outfit whipping people, and it was great. We loved it. It was fine. More recent ones, he kind of looks at Zoe Kravitz for a few minutes and then immediately runs away. Like, oh, what? Oh, all right. Something's happening here. Or the MCU. I, I mean, MCU is kind of famous for taking these male comedians and putting them on gallons of HGH and doing weird things to their bodies to make them look perfect. But every time I've seen an MCU movie, you've got these physically absurdly perfect people, but they have so little interest in each other. Occasionally, there will be a man shirtless, and a woman might kind of look at him and make a quip. Mm. But she doesn't look that interested in him. It's the way I might remark if I see a very nice coffee table. <laughs> like, well, that looks nice. Yeah. That looks pretty good, but there's nothing special about it. And, and I'm yeah. remembering the older Superman movies from the late 70s, early 80s. A big part of the running time is about this romance. Hmm. And it's such a big part of human existence is love and relationships and desire. And it's very sad to see that taken away. I think in that new, um, I saw that Black Widow movie, there's one character who gets horny and he's the fat buffoon. Hmm. And it's a man who's just been let out of prison, some scary, weird mountain Russian prison. He's been there for like 20 years and it re-encounters another agent who's played, I think, by Rachel Wise, who used to play his wife, and he's very excited to see her and trying to hook up with her, and he's treated as a creature of ridicule for that. But, I mean, that's what you do when you get out of prison. <laughs> you see an extremely beautiful woman who you were in a relationship with, like, yes, you're going to try to rekindle that. Why wouldn't you? And the entire movie is constantly making fun of his body because he's kind of heavy set. but I don't know, I think he looked good. He had, like, a really good sort of gruff dad bod thing going on. Like, I think he looked hot. Yeah, you mentioned in your essay the film Starship Troopers and the, the sort of fascist society that is right. depicted therein where everyone is beautiful and, and no one is horny. And, and one of the things that your essay is not just commenting on something that is sad, but to me something that is quite frightening because, you know, what are the societies that care only about the strength of the body, but it's divorced from pleasure. Well, they're Spartan fascist society. The militaristic Spartan fascist right. society is what it is. They're not good places to live. No. <laughs> they're not societies you want to be in. It's a bad time. Do you think this is tied somehow to, I don't know, nationalism, authoritarianism? I absolutely do, because this is a post-9-11 phenomenon, and I think that has a big thing to do with it. it. It goes with another change that I saw in blockbuster cinema, which was an increase in militarism, an increase in authoritarianism. Mm. Before 9-11, the cops and the military were usually the bad guys, even in mainstream cinema. Blade is like a, a big popular action movie, a Marvel movie, and cops are the bad guys in that movie. Uh. Wesley Snipes is attacking cops with a sword. <laughs> They're the bad guys. They work for the vampires. Usually in these older, older, uh, God, I guess they are older because I'm old now. In these movies, when the military shows up, they're usually assholes. The first Rambo, the military, is they're dipshits. The cops are monsters. 
And now we really can't show these forces as being a force for ill. We can't show our good guys beating them up or fighting them. They're also heroes. They're like real life superheroes. We have to salute, salute, salute them. So there's this tie to militarism. And also when a society gets very militaristic and very nationalistic, there is this part of this emphasis on the body and physical purity and wanting to be strong enough because you need to fight the enemy. And this happens over and over and over again in times of war, in times of imperialism, Mm -hmm. in times when there's an outside threat. People want to get really, really strong and muscular to fight. They have to fight. There's this anxiety about impurities and weakness, physical weakness causing some kind of national weakness. Yeah, I haven't watched uh, many Marvel films, but we did run an article in our magazine that was arguing by someone who was familiar with them, arguing that they're kind of the assumptions that fuel U.S. militarism and and empire are are sort of subtly present in a lot of mainstream superhero films and, of course, have been the whole history of, of the genre. Yeah, they're really, really blatant and really out there. And I think some good examples, too, in the recent ones are censoring the male body. There was that really famous thing that people found was that I think in a recent Aquaman movie, there's a character named Namor who's basically a a hunk in a little swimsuit. They digitally like removed his bulge and shrank his ass. Hmm. So you have a man who's obviously he's fit. He's in a swimsuit. He's in a pair of little tight shorts and they had to digitally remove any kind of eroticism from him. Like you had a guy, if you didn't want him to look like this, don't put him in a little swimsuit then. Like, put him in something else. But it it just shows it so perfectly to me that this is what the ideal body is. Mm. To the point, it's just only muscle and none of the other stuff. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, no glutes, apparently. You can't have those. Yeah. There's a lot to analyze, I feel like, about a society that where we have to hide any hint that a a gentleman might have genitals. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. And I've definitely heard people say that it's a response to me too, but I think maybe, but not in the way they realize. Now, Mm. I'm sure you know about the Hayes Code, the censorship code in American cinema. The Hayes Code formed partly to rehabilitate Hollywood's image, not because of the content, but because of some sort of hashtag Me Too, well, proto, you know, proto Me Too, obviously, scandals that happened off camera, there's a really famous example, the Fatty Arbuckle Mm. rape scandal. Fatty Arbuckle was this wildly popular comedic actor of the silent era, and he was accused of committing a really, really vicious rape. Obviously, I wasn't there, so I can't account on what actually happened. I don't know. I will never know. But it really hurt the image of Hollywood. It was this industry that put out filth that demoralized people and they committed filth off camera. So what Hollywood did was it cleaned up its image by promising to only put out bland, safe, puritanical content, which of course disproportionately ended up hurting like people of color, queer artists, female artists too. But that was the only thing they changed. They were just as abusive and exploitative sexually Mm. of actors and actresses behind the scenes anyway. Because cleaner content doesn't mean that you're actually a better person. It just means you're hiding it a little better. It doesn't make you better. I've also heard people suggest, well, doing sex scenes can be abusive. I find it very interesting that we're trying to get rid of them now. Now that the air is open for people to actually speak out about abuse on set. And now that we have intimacy coordinators, Hmm. there is, is a person now on Hollywood movie sets called an intimacy coordinator whose job is to make sure that love scenes are carried out in a way that's appropriate and respectful for all, all parties involved. And I think that's a great idea. So why in an era when we actually have these, when we actually have the ability to do this more safely than we did 20, 30, 40 years ago, are we cutting it out? And I find it also very interesting that there's this idea of, oh, well, maybe we shouldn't make people form do love scenes because it can be traumatizing for them. But we will not question the idea of making people do action scenes, which are potentially very dangerous. People get injured doing fight scenes. People can get killed on set doing action scenes. Right. And there's 
no idea. Of, well, we got to cut those out too. We got to cut those out too. I've heard so many people say, oh, well, why do we have to show a sex scene? Why can't we just fade to black and then show the aftermath? Well, why do we have to show a fight scene too? Fade to black and then tell us who won, right? Like it's an insane thing to propose. No one would actually do that. Right. Because violence is okay, even when shooting a, a scene with stunts is potentially dangerous. I mean, Alec Baldwin just shot a director. He, he killed someone, right. <laughs> yeah. He killed somebody. <laughs> yeah. Because the woman who was in charge of the prop guns was a fucking idiot. But we're not saying, oh, ban all guns from movies, ban all violence from movies. Right. After a woman died, Yeah, it's just a very, very American thing to say... Oh, someone was hurt. We got to ban sex, but not, oh, someone literally got shot. We need to ban violence. Like, that would never yeah. even be called into question. Well, there's long been this double standard with violence and, and sex, hasn't there? The MPAA yeah. has kind of been notorious for permitting a lot of, of violence and then being very puritanical about sex. And since sex is something that, you know, there's obviously a lot of risk, a lot of ethical questions, but fundamentally something that is healthy for a society if it goes well, yeah. whereas violence is almost always bad and also traumatizing and horrible and uh, continues a cycle of destruction. You might think that we would raise some more questions about violence than we would about sex, but it seems the other way around. Never. No. Not in this country. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to raise this question, and you brought it up yourself, of this idea of the ethics, that it is difficult to do sex scenes ethically. And what you were saying there suggests to me that, that your take on it is kind of that it fits into this whole, like, reforming things superficially while leaving the deep structural injustices behind the scenes. Like, we're not going to fix working conditions in the motion right. picture industry. <laughs> oh, of course, we're not going to do that. <laughs> no way. We'll just get rid of the scenes. So you don't have to see it and you don't have to think about it. But the exploitative and abusive working conditions are still going on behind the scenes. I mean, mm. we know, okay, Harvey Weinstein's out. But for him to carry on the way he did for as long as he did, he had to have so many enablers. He had to have so many people who knew what he was up to and turned a blind eye or helped him do it. And they're still there. They're not gone. He's gone. But all those people aren't gone. So how much change has there actually been? Yeah, you know, conservatives are always saying, oh, the, all the corporations have gone woke. But of course, the real fact is that all of the corporations have embraced a kind of rhetoric of, oh, we really care about justice now. <laughs> so they don't have to actually change any of their real practices. Yeah, it's a lot of lip service, but not a lot of actual significant change. And what ends up happening when we demand this kind of puritanism and moral purity is it actually ends up hurting people who are more marginalized. Hmm. Like the MPAA has been shown to be much, much harsher on sex scenes that show female pleasure than rape scenes. The people who made this film... Uh, Boys Don't Cry, it was a story about the murder of a trans mask young person named uh, Brendan Tina. The filmmakers had to fight the MPAA because the MPAA thought that during their sex scene, there was a female orgasm that lasted too long. Wouldn't want that. <laughs> and it's not even, you're not even seeing anything explicit. You're just seeing the actress from like shoulders up. Literally, you're just seeing her face. And their problem is she's having too much fun. <laughs> she's having too good a time. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, there are horrifying scenes of violence. I mean, this is a scene about a trans man being murdered. We don't need to cut that. That's fine. Yeah. That's perfectly acceptable to show. You can have sexual assault in your movie, but you can't have a woman having a really good time. And that's... Heartbreaking. <laughs> yeah. That's bleak to me. So who's that helping? That's not protecting women. Yeah, one thing I loved about your essay, and the reason I feel it has such an en enduring value is, you know, it helps, it's not just about this particular issue, but you help raise the sort of general question of how does what is included or what is not in our cultural objects, in our films, 
you know, reflect our values? What does it tell us about who we are and how do changes in what we include and, and what we don't tell us about changes in the broader society? Yeah, I mean, I, I do think there's a change in broader society in terms of how we live our life. That's probably just because of how razor thin the margin is for survival for so many people, how little a cushion you have if you have any financial trouble. So many of people are just a couple of missed paychecks away from being homeless. So you're constantly putting yourself in this idea of, I have to improve myself. I have to be perfect. I have to be better. I have to have my body perfect because I can't afford to get sick. Mm. If I get sick, I'll lose my job and then I'll end up sleeping in my car or I'll lose my house. And what that's led to is that we completely experience our lives in terms of how do we optimize ourselves? How do we make ourselves the best and the most superior and the hardiest and not how are we having fun? I draw a parallel to the way we design homes. Yes, I was going to bring this up, actually, because I think this is so totally fascinating. You're talking about McMansions. (laughs) Yeah, McMansions, which I know seems like a weird parallel. But if you look at the way homes are designed, a lot of times people are designing them thinking in terms of not where do I want to live? how would I like to live in this house? But in terms of how can I maximize my investment? Mm. What will change the resale price of this house? Well, breakfast nooks. We have to include a breakfast nook. Do we eat breakfast at home? No. How many people eat breakfast at home anymore? Very few people eat breakfast at home every day. Most of us eat it in the car. (laughs) You stop by Starbucks and grab a latte on the way to work or something, or you eat a granola bar at your desk. Very few people eat breakfast together with their families at home. But you got to have a breakfast nook. You got to have a nook specifically for this meal that we don't eat because that will sell the house. You got to have this kind of ceiling. Do you want that kind of ceiling? No, but I got to have it. You got to have this. You got to have that feature. You got to have a chandelier that is a nightmare to clean and there's no way to replace the light bulb in it. So when it burns out, fuck you. (laughs) Your giant foyer is dark now. That's it. But you got to have it because that increases the resale value. And as a result, you have these homes that are horrible to live in. Mm. They're not functional to live in. They're not good for your family to even live in. They're impossible to cook in. Whenever I look at a McMansion kitchen, all I can think is like, it would actually really suck to cook here. Yeah. You've got two ovens, but no work service next to the oven. That's something I notice all the time. Like your ovens are weirdly isolated from any counter space. So if you're actually trying to cook there, you, you know, you chop your vegetables, you put it in the pan and then you have to walk across carrying something, which means you're more likely to like slip and fall while holding whatever it is that you're holding. You're Mm. more likely to spill. Maybe you'll trip over the cat. It's just not a practical work surface. And when you look at older homes, the kitchen actually kind of makes sense because they're designed for people who cooked and were thinking, okay, the wife is going to make some nice meals in this place. We need it to make sense. Well, I mean, you talk about how the, this trend, actually, you can see it if you look at the houses in movies, right? So you talk about how you look at old movies, you see people, yes. you know, kind of messy, lived-in houses, and you say, and I'll just go quote you here, compare this to homes in films now, massive, sterile, cavernous spaces with minimalist furniture, kitchens are industrial sized and spotless, and they contain no food. There is no excess, there is no mess. There's no food in kitchens. There's never any food. <laughs> <laughs> there are lots of expensive devices used to prepare consumables, but there's no food in kitchens. I did notice this from films of the 1980s when they'd show a family home. The kitchen has cereal boxes on the counter. Mm. There's like a bowl of fruit somewhere. It's kind of messy because that's what a kitchen looks like in a home where people live Mm. because people need to eat food. And I'm always startled by these giant homes that people live in. In contemporary film, the kitchens, they look like a laboratory or something. Mm. It's not a place where people would just eat. It's not a place where people would cook. It's there. Maybe you grab a smoothie. Maybe you grab like some Soylent or something. I don't know. Yeah. I think you'd probably agree that one of the facts about this is that it ends up making worse art. I was struck by a passage in your essay where you talk about the movie Inception, which is about dreams and the, and the subconscious. And you, and you point out that, again, you talk about the absence of sex 
Like right. if you enter the deepest realms of someone's subconscious. Yeah, you're going to see a horrifying, bizarre sexual pathology. Right. And there's nothing there. He goes <laughs> like five levels deep inside a rich man's mind. And <laughs> if you go inside a rich man's subconscious, you are going to find the most horrifying, nightmarish stuff. Yeah. Freakish Oedipus complex stuff. Nightmarish daddy issues. And he finds like a, a ski lodge. There's like some guys on jet skis with guns. No, no. <laughs> but if we're trying to you know, make art that tells us the truth about ourselves, we certainly don't do it with spotless kitchens and perfect bodies. And I, it reminded me of this other great essay that you wrote about uh, safe fiction and the kind of tendency towards the formulaic and the disnified in fiction, that it is similarly kind of avoiding mess. Yeah, that's something I've absolutely noticed in speculative fiction. I can't really comment on literary fiction because that's not exactly my wheelhouse. But in speculative fiction, what I've noticed is as there has been an increase in openly queer stories with openly queer themes, it's become more and more and more sterile and sexless and less messy. I think there's a fear of being seen as doing negative representation or fetishizing people or something like that. But the result is you're not really portraying queer life. You're portraying this kind of cute Disney version of queer life. Like I've seen so many books get hyped up as being, wow, this book is so queer. It's so gay. And all the two male leads do is hold hands. Mm. And this is a book aimed at adults. If this was YA, it would be different. But in a book that's ostensibly aimed for adults that calls itself a queer fiction and the most obscene thing people do is, I don't know, share a malt like at a 1950s soda counter. You're not really offering queer representation. And in the context of a society that's showing a bigger and bigger backlash to queerness, to public displays of queerness, mm. there's the whole groomer panic where if anything gay occurs within a 50 mile radius of a child, then it's apparently some kind of abuse. <laughs> Every year, kink at Pride discourse starts earlier and earlier and earlier, and we're demanding G-rated Pride parades. In the context of a society with that going on, I find it very, very disturbing that what should be sort of an underground, what could be a, a subculture, is saying, yes, queerness is acceptable if it's completely, completely castrated. Hmm. Queerness is wholesome and acceptable if they're not allowed to have sex. I mean, that's something that right-wing religious conservatives say, right? Right. Oh, we're not anti-gay. We are love the sin or hate the sin. We love homosexuals as long as they don't have homosexual sex. <laughs> as long as there's just two people standing next to each other like in a 1950s Sears ad. <laughs> like, Then they can be of any, any gender you like. <laughs> right. And that's not good to me. I find that deeply troubling. <laughs> it's very reactionary. Yeah. And meanwhile, queer writers who do include sexuality in their works and include any kind of messiness or moral ambiguity, who maybe have queer characters who do bad things because, hey, everybody's a human being. Human beings do bad things sometimes, really get attacked in really vicious, vicious ways. Mm. It's self censorship. And that's appalling. We have enough threat of censorship from the far right to the point where we don't need to censor ourselves. And it's worse when it's coming from inside. When the call's coming from inside the house, it's much more frightening than when it's coming from outside. Mm -hmm. I just want to read a little quote from this essay. You say, we don't fall in love with art because it's safe. We fall in love with it because it surprises us, thrills us, horrifies us, expands our minds, shows us something we haven't seen before. We fall in love with art precisely because it is not safe. Right. I wrote that because I've seen in the speculative fiction community, and, and not universally, but in the sort of center of it, among the award that gets hyped up, among the group that gets the big publishing contracts, among the group that wins the industry awards, there's a lot of talking about safety and making art that feels safe and making art that's wholesome and not about making art that really kind of mm. stirs the emotions. And I find that really, really disturbing. Part of this article, the reason I wrote it was a response to this notorious controversy within science fiction about a 
debut trans author named Isabel Fall, who published a short story in Clark's World called I Sexually Identify as an Attack Helicopter. Mm. And it's a really terrifically funny story. Well, funny, interesting story that takes that classic kind of transphobic joke meme and spins it into a story that's about militarism and queer assimilation and personal identity. And it was a terrific story. And she got attacked by major, major figures in the industry, like major, major big name editors and writers, people who are leaders in that industry, like accused her secretly of being a man, which is a horrible thing Mm -hmm. to accuse somebody of just misgendering someone. They accused her of being a Nazi secretly. Hmm. And the stress of this was so awful on her that she stopped publishing under her name and went back into the closet. Like driving a debut trans author back into the closet is a horrible thing to do. It's a nasty thing to do. How is that keeping the community safe? Mm -hmm. And it wasn't like a harmful story. And On top of this, after this thing happened, a lot of the people who took part in this harassment mob ended up accepting sponsorship for the Worldcon Hugo Award ceremony from Raytheon. (laughs) Oh boy, yeah, there you go. From Raytheon, the defense contractor. So it's like, are you kidding me? Yeah. (laughs) There's some fucked values here. (laughs) Some really (laughs) fucked values. (laughs) So I have to wonder if the reaction wasn't so much about just avoiding unpleasant content, but also about protecting the notion of militarism and imperialism. Mm. Mm -hmm. Like, why aren't you more mad about that? (laughs) Yeah, like actual sponsorship from Raytheon. And and in order to accept that, it had to go through several layers of committees, subcommittees, many layers of approval. And after all this... Apparently, nobody in this decision-making process said, like, hey, people might get mad if we do this. This is kind of fucked up, guys. Maybe we shouldn't do this. People might object to it. Yeah. The people who organized that convention were genuinely shocked when they got pushback for it. I don't think they recognized or even understood why people might be mad about it. And that's shocking to me because this is an industry that likes to tout itself as being much more open to diverse and much more socially just and much more considerate and kind and good. And they're accepting sponsorship from a company that built bombs that we drop on peasant children. Right. That's appalling to me. So, you know, Isabel Fall took an artistic risk, did something that was original and kind of uh, daring, and then, of course, was... uh, shouted away into oblivion and i mean it seems to me like at the just to sort of uh, conclude here it seems to me like at the core of both of your essays that we've cited the one about safe fiction and the one about uh, sex in movies you know there is this kind of even though you're doing critique of existing tendencies there is an implicit vision for a kind of alternate world of artistic production in which people do take risks, they're bold, they're daring, they right. don't shy away from the dark side or the messy side or the sexy side of things. Yeah, I'd like to see people approaching works that make us upset in good faith. Because mm. I think what happened a lot with the helicopter story is people read the story and it made them feel bad, but instead of unpacking, why does this make me feel bad? Or accepting hey, sometimes art is supposed to make us feel bad. You know, like that Trent Reznor thing that he says in concert, he greeted people going, is everyone having a good time? We shouldn't. We're Nine Inch Nails. We're here to have a bad time. And accepting that sometimes is here to have a bad time. (laughs) And that's okay. Or finding art that if art upsets you, maybe critique it in a way that's a little more thoughtful, a little more nuanced. Instead of just, this is harmful, we need to destroy the life of the person who made this, going, well, why does this upset me? Is this offensive? Is this not offensive? Is this perhaps in poor taste? And is it possible the artist is working in poor taste on purpose? Yeah. Sort of what's going on instead of this really vicious policing, because what this policing has done is it very clearly, I don't think it hasn't made 
publishing. It hasn't made creativity safer for marginalized people. If anything, it's made marginalized people police themselves much, much, much more strictly Mm. in order to avoid offending sort of white, cishet, bougie people. I've spoken to so many trans sci-fi, fantasy, horror, dark fiction writers who say that they've kind of had to rein themselves in because they're afraid of being attacked in the same way. And I don't want that. That is the opposite of what I want. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that means we have to tolerate actual, like, hate, actual abuse. Obviously, if someone writes a story that's, that is really obviously, like, hateful or, or racist or something, yeah, call them out. That's fine. Right. But I'm saying just approach art looking in with a little more nuance than is this wholesome or is this harmful? Yeah. Because there's more than two things that art can be. I mean, wholesomeness, we have this obsession with wholesomeness and wholesomeness, that word makes me worried because that's yeah. usually a word used by reactionaries who want censorship. And almost always it's censorship of queer art and censorship of feminist art and subversive art, censorship of leftist art, and usually censorship of ethnic and cultural minorities as well. Yeah, we want things that are distinctly unwholesome in some ways. I mean, you know, you're pointing out that the wholesomization of films in the Everyone is Beautiful essay is a homogenization. Yeah, it absolutely is. I mean, people will sometimes talk about the MCU and say like, oh, it's diverse. Like, It took them, what, like 23 to 25 movies before they put a black man as the main character. Mm. It took them at least 20 movies before they made a female main character. How many of their movies have had female main characters? Like two or three now? Mm. They really only started putting in diverse casts when the big ticket IPs were used up and they had the leftover shit like The Eternals. (laughs) Like, who gives a shit about The Eternals? You know, they didn't give you, like, a black Thor, because mm. they care about Thor. They gave you a black Kingo, or I, I forget who Kingo was played by, but because Thor is a useful, is a very profitable enterprise, and no one cares who Kingo is. No one cares who Sprite is. Yeah. No one knows these names, so it's kind of like giving the crappy hand-me-down toys to your kid sister. Like, I don't want this anymore. You can have it. Wow, thanks. Yeah. And we're supposed to be excited about that. And of course, they're only finally doing it in response to a great deal of pressure, people pointing out right. the lack of, lack of diversity. But yes, a uh, conclusion of everyone is beautiful and no one is horny. We must let characters desire each other. They must be allowed to fuck. Yeah. <laughs> or at least look at each other. Or at least at look least at each other. With look at each level. other, for Christ's sake. <laughs> and they should be allowed to eat carbs again. And carbs again. And carbs again. Let actors eat carbohydrates again, please. Yeah. Well, I think everyone should read this essay. I think it's very thought provoking. I think it is an important observation of something that is actually happening and is scary and horrible that I don't like. Uh, the essay is Everyone is Beautiful and No One is Horny. It was published years ago in uh, Blood and Knife. I have been joined today by R.S. Benedict. You can find her work at rsbenedict.substack.com. She's the host of the Right Good Podcast. R.S. Benedict, thank you so much for joining us on Current Affairs today. Thank you for having me on. The Current Affairs Podcast is a product of Current Affairs Magazine. If you are not subscribed to Current Affairs Magazine, visit currentaffairs.org slash subscribe today and get our glorious print edition. The Current Affairs Podcast is released regularly every week on patreon.com slash current affairs. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.